Have you been telling yourself that you are the best? Have you been telling yourself that you are awesome? And have you been telling yourself that whatever will happen will happen for good? Yes, you should. Hello, this is Hina from Team Walad. How are you? This is Literary Theory, today's revision series in our net cracker question and answers, okay? Well, why did I tell you? Do you tell yourself you're beautiful, you're awesome, and you deserve the best in life? It is because literally when we are approaching the exam or when the exam approaches us, we get a very haunting feeling sometimes, right? We feel that, oh God, do I even know something, right? It happens with all of us. But then I'm telling you, when you will sit in the examination hall, you will definitely remember everything. Tell yourself that I will remember everything. I will not lose my confidence. And at the end of the day, as I tell you, whatever will happen will happen for your best. Let's start with today's question answers based on literary theory. Question number one. Through the work titled Shakespearean Tragedy, this critic popularized the theory of tragic flaw in analyzing Shakespeare, Shakespeare's tragedies. Identify this critic. Basically, which author has written this work called as Shakespearean Tragedy? A. A.C. Bradley, B. Alan Sinfield, C. Jonathan Dolimore, or D. Stephen Greenblatt? The writer of Shakespearean tragedy is A. A. C. Bradley. Well, A. C. Bradley has spoken about tragic flaw. What is tragic flaw? It is this internal imperfection which brings about the downfall of the hero. Okay. Whenever a hero's downfall happens, it happens because he has a tragic flaw, because he has an imperfection within him which has brought this fate of his. Yes, this is what A. C. Bradley has discussed in his work, Shakespearean tragedy. Basically, when A.C. Bradley was teaching at Oxford, at that time, he compiled his lectures together and then brought about this work called as Shakespearean tragedy. Okay. Easiest example of this tragic flaw is, for example, Othello. Othello had this tragic flaw of believing in people's prejudices around him. So he believed that being a black, he could never get real love. Nobody would love him truly. And that is why he did not trust Desdemona. He was like, Desdemona is loving him. It's not true love. You know, it is out of some purpose. So this is what tragic flaw or an internal imperfection, which brings about the downfall of the hero, is spoken about by A.C. Bradley in his work called as Shakespearean Tragedy. Easy, easy. Question number two. Which school of theory focused on not just the historical context of the author of a text, but the socio-cultural milieu of the critic too? Basically, which school of theory focused on the author as well as the critic? Isn't this an easy question? The options are A, new criticism, B, cultural studies, C, reader response criticism, or D, new historicism. It is option D, new historicism. New historicism is equals to author plus critic. This was developed in the year 1980s by Stephen Greenblatt. It is a form of cultural poetics. Why? Because poetry is studied in context of the culture. We study a piece of work in context of its culture. Culture means the author who wrote it. And of course, the critic who is analyzing it, okay? So this is what Stephen Greenblatt says in New Historicism, that a historical context of the author of the text has to be analyzed along with the socio-cultural milieu of the critic also. Easy, New Historicism. Let's move to question number three. Which novel did Schlowiski praise as the most typical novel in world literature? A. Tristram Shandy, B. Anna Karenina, C. Tom Jones, or D. Eugene Wan Jin. Schlowiski said, most typical novel in world literature. In fact, he said that he was in a sense of chaos after reading this novel. It is option A, Tristram Shandy. Well, published in nine volumes, this work is by Lawrence Stern. Now, why did Schlowiski, the critic, okay, why did he call Tristram Shandy as the most typical novel? There are a few reasons behind it. First, the action constantly breaks off. That is, the author returns to the beginning 
and then leaps forward. The author returns to the beginning, then leaps forward, which means the action is constantly breaking off. The second reason why Tristram Shandy is so typical, the book begins as an autobiography of Tristram. But then we realize in you know, after a few volumes, there is a discussion about hero's birth. How is it an autobiography then? That's the confusion. That is what is the puzzle. Third, the main plot gets interrupted by dozens of pages of crazy, whimsical information. For example, talking about nose of somebody, talking about some other crazy stuff. That is what Shlowiski said. He's praising or he's criticizing. We don't know. But Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern is the most typical novel in world literature, according to Shlowiski. Okay, and he said it in which work of his? In Theory of Prose. Question number four. Which of the following are the seven character types identified by Vladimir Prop? Who is Vladimir Prop? Well, he was a Soviet scholar and a folklorist who lived from 1895 to 1917. He has discussed seven character types. Okay, seven character types in any story. Can you tell me what are these seven character types by Vladimir Prop? I am not reading all these options. You please go, you know, around them. See, I'll tell you the answer directly. It is option A. Hero, villain, dispatcher, helper, donor, princess, fall hero. Don't worry, we shall discuss them fast, fast. You will love it. Now see, Ladimir basically gave a lot of importance to what story and character together. He said that a good story needs to be character driven. That is, the actions of the character are very important in moving the story forward. And because of this, Vladimir studied almost 100, 100 fairy tales of his times. Can you imagine? And after going about these 100 fairy tales, he came to the conclusion that these archetypal seven character types are important and are present in any story. Let's start with them. First is villain. Who is the villain? Who at the start of the story causes a damage or a misfortune? That is the villain. Second is the donor or the provider. Who is a donor or a provider? He is an agent who helps the hero to fight this villain. The third is the helper. Helper also helps the hero in which way? In getting an object which will help him to fight the hero. So helper helps hero get an object to fight the villain, okay? Helper uses his intelligence or force for this. The fourth character, according to Ladimir Prop, is the princess. Of course, how can a story be there without a heroine? So it is the princess or the sought after person. That is, a hero wants to rescue the princess, right? Then next fifth is dispatcher. Who is a dispatcher? Dispatcher is someone who calls for help of the hero. Help me, help me. It can be a person of high stature, a king or a tsar, somebody like that. So he's the dispatcher, okay? Next is the hero, of course, the hero of the story. Heroes are also of two types, seeker and victim. And the last character type, according to Vladimir Prop, is false hero. Who is a false hero? Someone who takes credit of hero's success at the end of the story. It can be hero's brother or some other character who says, all this happened because of me, he takes the credit. So the seven character types are hero, villain, dispatcher, helper, donor, princess, false hero, identified by Vladimir Prop, a Soviet scholar and folklorist. Question number five, who of the following said, sex has a frequently neglected political aspect? A, Kate Millett, B, Elaine Scholter, C, Toril Moi, or D, Simone de Bois? Sex has a frequently neglected political aspect. Of course, it is Kate Millett. He, she discussed it in her 1970 published work called A Sexual Politics. Now she says, what does she say? She's an American feminist writer. And she says that sex has a political aspect, but it is neglected. She defined it by defining works of three important writers. Let me name them first. D.H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, and Norman Mailer. Now, what does Kate Millett say about D.H. Lawrence? She attacks Lawrence for showing a very so strong sex drive of a male. After this, Kate Millett attacks another person, that is Mailer. She attacks Mailer 
because Mailer is fearful of losing power to women. Then Kate attacks Miller. By, you know why? Why does she attack Miller? Because she says that Miller's works are misogynist. That is, they have this strong prejudice against women. Now, she says, what does Kate say? Understand. She says politics is basically a power-centered relationship. Politics is a power-centered relationship, while sex is also a relationship between two people. Now, how is sex a political aspect? It is a relationship of power between two people where the male powers over the women or the male dominates the female. Therefore, sex has a political aspect, Kate says, but then it is neglected. Did you understand? You did. You did, right? This takes us to question number six. Which of the following can be regarded as an example of epistemic violence? A, the Atlantic slave trade. B, the destruction of Native American tribes. C, the East India Company's control of trade in India. Or D, Macaulay's minutes on Indian education. First, you should know what is the meaning of epistemic. You know it. Epistemic means related to knowledge. Because epistemology, in epistemology, we study knowledge right? So now when you use knowledge in order to violate rules, when you use knowledge for violence, that is called as epistemic violence. You know Macaulay's minutes on Indian education. It spoke about how Indians should be given Western education, how the funds from Britain should be used only to impart Western education to Indians and not Oriental education. So Macaulay's minutes on education is a kind of epistemic violence, a knowledge violence, violence which is imparted with the help of knowledge, Macaulay's minutes. Question number seven, which of the following is not an example of hybridity? Not an example of hybridity. A, pidgin or pigeon, you know, it's called pigeon. B, mestizo culture. C, magic realism. Or D, Native American culture. What is hybridity? Of course, you know, hybridity means a mixed character, something which is composed of different elements. They come together and it's a hybrid, right? So, Pigeon. What is a pigeon? Pigeon is a language which is constructed by combining different languages. So basically, there are two strangers who want to communicate. So then they bring about some common words and sounds or body language. That is what forms a pigeon, which means you are combining different languages. So pigeon is a hybridity. Mestizo culture. What is mestizo? Mestizos are people of mixed race, especially people belonging to Spanish Europe, like they're Spanish Europeans and American Indians. So a combination of Spanish Europeans and American Indians is mestizo. Their culture is mestizo culture. So again, it's hybridity. What is magic realism? You know it, right? Real plus surreal. Reality plus fantasy. That is magic realism. So we are left with Native American culture, which has no hybridity about it. So hybridities no example of hybridity, which means Native American culture is not an example of hybridity. Easy? Easy. Question number eight. Derrida associated speech with A, logos, B, presence, C, meaning, or D, rationality. Come on, tell me. Come on. There is a word here which actually means speech. It is logos. So the answer has to be logos. The word used by Aristotle. It is a mode of persuasion in rhetoric, which means it is an art of effective speech, effective speaking. If you like my speech, my logos is very strong. So logos is this art of effective speaking. It's a mode of persuasion, according to Aristotle. And therefore, Derrida associated speech with Logos. Derrida, the French philosopher, right? In which book of his? In Of Grammatology. This takes us to question number nine. Who among the following is not an American semiotician? A. Barbara Johnson, B. C. S. Pierce, C. Noam Chomsky, or D. Charles Morris? Not an American semiotician. Who are semioticians who study signs and symbols? 
So Barbara Johnson is not a semiotician. You have to learn it, okay? Basically, Barbara is an American literary critic and a translator, but C.S. Pierce is a semiotician, Noam Chomsky is a semiotician, Charles Morris is a semiotician. Question number 10. Who authored Towards a Poetics of Culture, an essay that looks at how or what causes culture to manifest in specific ways in terms of new historicism? This is a very easy question. We discussed the culture of poetics, the poetic culture, new historicism, few questions back. Who authored Towards a Poetics of Culture? It has to be Stephen Greenblatt, the famous new historicist. He's one of the founders of new historicism, right? So in this work, Towards the Poetics of Culture, Stephen Greenblatt is talking about how culture is studied as a text. That is, what causes culture to develop in a certain way, okay? So whenever we're studying a book, we study the historical context of that book. We study about the culture in which it was produced. Right? So this is what new historicism is. And the work towards the poetics of culture is written by Stephen Greenblatt. Easy? Easy. Which of the following is not a work by Elaine Schalter? Let's learn them together. A, sexual anarchy. B, the female malady. C, histories. D, Shakespeare's wife. And E, a literature of their own. Elaine Schalter, famous American literary critic, born in the year 1963. She is currently 82 years old. And she developed the concept of gynocritics. What is gynocritics? Study of women as writers. Her most important works are sexual anarchy. The female malady, histories, a literature of their own. Or let me tell you, these are also not complete titles. If you go around, you see them on the internet. These titles are long, okay? So Shakespeare's Wife is not written by Elaine. Shakespeare's Wife is a book by Germaine Grier, published in the year 2007. She's an Australian feminist writer, Germaine Grier, Shakespeare's Wife, okay? Question number 12. Which of the following is not an area of study within psychological criticism? What is psychological criticism? When you study any work through psychology, okay, you are studying the characters, the work through psychology, okay? That is called psychological criticism. So a psychoanalysis is an area of study. Yes, of course. Cognitive psychology, yes. Behaviorism, yes. But structural linguistics, don't you feel with the name only you can recognize the answer? What is structural linguistics? What is linguistics, which focuses on language, which focuses on the internal elements of language. So this is not connected with psychology, okay? So structural linguistics is not an area of study within psychological criticism. Easy? Easy. Question number 13. Which literary critic and Marxist political theorist famously draws out the differences between mindsets of modernism and postmodernism by comparing Van Gogh's peasant shoes with Andy Warhol's diamond dust shoes. Basically, this critic, you know, this critic showed two very important paintings, peasant shoes and diamond dust shoes. And with the help of these two paintings, he compared modernism with postmodernism. Who is he? Frederick Jameson, Terry Eagleton, Giles Deleuze, or Slavoj Zizek? Zizek. Tell me. It is Frederick Jameson. See, I'll make it very easy for you. I've got it here. Look here. Look here. One minute. Yeah. Okay. Can you see these paintings? The first one is by Van Gogh. This is a very poor kind of painting. Uh, work as you can see not the work as in what he has portrayed is a is poverty they are peasant shoes van gogh you know the famous dutch painter now come here andy warhol andy a very 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 famous you know uh creative designer he designed this painting called as diamond dust shoes these shoes they are studded with diamond okay so now frederick jameson what did he do he compared these two shoes in order to compare the mindsets of modernism and postmodernism. Did you understand? 
So this literary critic and Marxist political theorist is Frederick Jameson. Is it easy? It is easy. Question number 14. Just a second. Which of the following books is not cited by Eve Kosowski Sedgwick in her Epistemology of the Closet to find out the traces of homosexuality in literature? So basically, which author has not been cited by Sedgwick in her work Epistemology of the Closet? It's an easy question. Let me tell you the options. A Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. B Billy Budd by Herman Melville. C. Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust or D. The Rainbow by D.H. Lawrence. See, Sedgwick is an American scholar in the field of queer theory, okay? So her uh, forte lies in queer theory. Now, she is actually one of the founders also of queer theory. And this book of hers, this book of Sedgwick called as Epistemology of Closet, talks about human sexuality by picking up few authors' works. Which authors has Sedgwick picked up in Epistemology of Closet? Listen to the names of the authors. Marcel Proust, Herman Melville, Oscar Wilde, Frederick Nietzsche, and that's it. M Michel Foucault, Michel Foucault, I forgot. So now here, see, Oscar Wilde is given, Herman Melville is given, Marcel Proust is given. D.H. Lawrence, no. She examined which, who all, you know, which authors were examined by Sedgwick? Oscar Wilde, Herman Melville, Marcel Proust, Michel Foucault, and one more, Frederick Nietzsche. Okay, so the answer is The Rainbow by D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence has not been analyzed by Sedgwick in Epistemology of a Closet, a book in which she talks about human sexuality, right? Easy. Question number 15. Which of the following ideas is not given by Jacques Derrida? Not given. A. Phelogocentrism. B. Arch writing. C. Hauntology. Or D. Repressive desublimation. Tell me. See, phelogocentrism is a term given by Derrida. Arch writing is also by him. Hauntology is also by him. Repressive desublimation is not by him. It is by the Frankfurt School. Herbert Mercuse in 1964 gave this term repressive desublimation. Now quickly, I'll tell you what is phelogocentrism. Phelogocentrism means a male-centric point of view. What is arch writing? Arch writing is a form of language which is not derived from speech, okay? It has preceded the speech and writing. That is arch writing. Arch means origin. And hauntology. What is hauntology? Well, this means returning of the past. Returning of the past in the manner of a ghost. This can be coined in music, politics, philosophy, not just in literature. So hauntology, arch writing, phelogocentrism, all are terms by Derrida. But repressive desublimation is by Herbert Marcuse, right, from the Frankfurt School. Question number 16, a reading of a literary work that is determined by its effect or emotional impact on the reader has been termed as A, aporia, B, intentional fallacy, C, dislocation of sensibility, or D, affective fallacy. It is a mistake, okay? Fallacy, a misconception where you actually, you know, judge a poem by the emotional effect it arouses in the reader. That is affective fallacy. Yes, the term which has been coined by Wimsatt and Beardsley in 1949, right? This is a principal term used in new criticism, right? Affective fallacy. It's a misconception. It should not be done, you know? You should not judge a poem by the emotional effects it arouses in the reader. No, that's affective fallacy. Question number 17. When a poet moves towards discontinuity with the precursor by rejecting deliberately the ideas and objectives of the precursors, Harold Bloom calls it A. Kleinerman, B. Tessere, C. Kenosis, or D. Eskesis. So when you completely empty out, when you completely uh, take yourself away from the precursors, that term is called kenosis. Kenosis is a Greek word which means empty out to avoid repetition. Kenosis is important. Why? Because, you know, you need to innovate. You need to be original. You cannot take the continuity of the precursors. You cannot take the ideas and the objectors, objectives of the precursors who came before you. No, 
Okay, so when the poet moves towards discontinuity with the precursor, it is called kenosis. Harold Bloom called it kenosis. Kenosis, if you check the dictionary, means to empty out, okay, to start afresh. Easy, easy, easy. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Okay, you know everything. Breathe. You're awesome. Question number 18. Who among the following famously did a narratological study of Marcel Proust's remembrance of thing past in his narrative discourse and easy method? Just tell me the author of this work, narrative discourse and easy method. A. Louis Althusser, B. Gerard Jennett, C. Ferdinand de Saussure or D. A. J. Grimace. Can you tell me? It is option B, Gerard Jennett. Gerard Jennett, basically the French literary critic, wrote this work, Narrative Discourse and Easy Method, in which he talks about different narrative discourses or those conditions which make a narrative possible. He talks about narrative techniques in this work. And here is where he did a study of Remembrance of Thing Past by Marcel Proust. Okay? Question number 19. Who introduced the distinction between iconic, indexical, and symbolic signs? A. Ferdinand de Saussure, B. Jack Derrida, C. Charles Sanders Pierce, or D. Claude Levi Strauss? Who spoke about icon, index, and symbol and distinguished between them? It is option C, C. S. Pierce. This is my favorite question. I would love to tell you icon, index, and symbol. See, what is an icon? Whenever you buy a phone, there's an icon of phone above it. These are all pictures, okay? We're talking about signs here. So whenever I buy a laptop, there is a photo of laptop above. That's an icon. When I buy a fridge, there's a photo of fridge on the cardboard, you know, which carries the fridge. So all these are icons. Basically, there is a complete physical resemblance between the signifier and the signified. That is an icon. What is a symbol? There is no, no resemblance between the signifier and the signified. You have to realize what is signified with the help of your knowledge. Easiest example. Male is denoted by this, you know, circle and then an arrow. Female is denoted by a circle and then down. How do we know male is that, female is that? These are symbols, no, for male and female. It is by our knowledge. Now, when you buy food, there is a green symbol or a red symbol. What is the meaning of green and red? Green means veg vegetarian food. Red means non-vegetarian food. Is there any connection between green, red symbol and veg, non-veg? No, it's a symbol. I know it by my knowledge that green means veg and red means non-veg. Now, what is index? Index means there is an evidence of what this signifier represents. For example, you find a picture of smoke which represents fire. So that's an index. You find a picture of thermometer, which represents what? Temperature. That's an index. So icon, index, symbol, they all were distinguished by C.S. Pierce, right? The American philosopher of 1800s. And this takes us to the last question of the day. Who in his, the dismemberment of Orpheus, famously gave a table of differences between modernism and postmodernism. A. Jean Frecau Lyotard, B. Walter Benjamin, C. Ihab Hassan, or D. R. Levin. Who wrote the dismemberment of Orpheus? It is option C. Ihab Hassan, an Egypt-born American literary theorist who lived from 1925 to 2015. So now Ihab Hassan speaks about dismemberment of Orphe Orpheus. You should know what is dismemberment. It means killing. And Orpheus was this superhuman musical person. He had superhuman musical skills. He was a very, very famous musician from Greece. So you're killing this, you know, awesome musician. So here in this book, you know, Ihab Hassan has spoken about, or Ihab Hassan, he's spoken about four famous uh, modern theorists and here is where he gives differences between modernism and postmodernism who are these four authors that ihab has studied they are hemingway kafka janet beckett the four modern authors okay and here we are done with literary theory and i hope you learned something out of it and you learned not to stress too much please don't stress too much everything will be great this is hina from Team Wallet, it was lovely being with you. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.